Welcome again to the University of Nottingham and the Department of Theology and Religious Studies. Professor Philip Goodchild is the Professor of Philosophy and Religion in the Department and he is going to speak to us today about the notion of philosophy as a spiritual exercise. Philip, the notion of spiritual exercise, the phrase goes back to Ignatius of Loyola in the 16th century and may even have an older history than that. But one thinks of, with, one thinks of it as belonging very much to religion, to piety, to theology, indeed to religious cult. You're suggesting that philosophy, which we think of as something completely other, is a spiritual exercise. Can you? In the ancient Greek origins of philosophy, um, particularly with a figure such as Socrates, he appeared to go around trying to persuade the Athenians to have a care for their own souls. And um, what he perhaps meant by this is that he was somewhat astonished that they should be so concerned about seeking wealth, seeking honours, seeking reputation or, or life, leading a life of pleasure but shouldn't, uh, shouldn't take a care primarily that their souls were as wise and as excellent as possible. And it's a suggestion that people make a mistake about what's really important and what's less important. And it's one thing to try to work out through reason what is really important. But then to live your life according to what you take as most important, that's a different meaning of philosophy. It was there in the ancient Greeks, and possibly they were using reason as a way of identifying how they should live, but the most important part should be that it was a way of life. So, in many cases, the word philosophy seems to be the most theoretical a, a way of considering anything. So there is a philosophy of this or the philosophy of that. In other words, something that is completely divorced from the praxis. You're actually suggesting that to recover philosophy as a practice, a, something that not theory, but practice. It, it's a question of what is the best way of living. And theory has arisen from thinking we have our habits, we have our ways of doing things, we have our institutions, but are these the best way of doing things and can we give reasons for them or reasons against? And then you get into the theoretical realm. But that is a, in some sense a support for the actual process of constructing and living out ways of life. You mentioned Socrates and Socrates goes around with the motto know thyself. Mm -hmm. Is that the starting point for, 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 for philosophy as a spiritual practice? It certainly has been. It might not be the way I would pursue it best today. Perhaps we can never fully know ourselves or the more we know ourselves the less we we like of what we find. Yeah. For me, I would put the emphasis elsewhere, and it's to do with what we pay attention to. So uh, there's, there's two aspects of thinking. Thinking might be coming to conclusions, following reasons. But also there's this other aspect that when you're thinking, you're paying attention to things. And the conclusions that you come to are largely based on what you notice, what's within the scope of your judgment, what you pay attention to. I tend to find that philosophical debates, particularly in a sphere like philosophy of religion, are somewhat interminable. People never are fully persuaded by each other's case, uh, reasons or cases or arguments, and it becomes a kind of unending battleground because really people have already come to their conclusions and the conclusions that they've come to are partly on the basis of the way they were brought up, their culture, the traditions they've inherited. But these shape the way they see things and shape what they pay attention to. 
Now, it's very hard to change your habits or to step outside of yourself, but if you pay attention to slightly different things, different from what you would normally do so, that might lead to various insights that then change your habits, your presuppositions, change where you're coming from, and don't work so much at the level of the rationalizations you give after the fact for your beliefs, but work more directly on your inner nature. So this is a different operation of philosophy that's not primarily to do with manipulating propositions and the reasons for thinking that one is true and another is false or erroneous. It's a matter of orienting thought, orienting your attention. So you're really for, you, what you're really suggesting is that philosophy has to return to before its Cartesian expression. Yes, or even older than that, although having said that, it's not that I personally would want to um, follow the practices of the Stoics or the Epicureans who held a comparable notion of philosophy as a, as a way of life. You say pay attention. Yes. Could you give me an example of paying attention to something that may illustrate what that means? It, it's very simple, it's just what you're thinking about. But to pay attention in a way that might transform how you think, it might involve seeing the world as someone else sees it. So if we're having an argument, I might hear your reasons, your point of view, and then I might want to dispute them and, and look for flaws or look for assumptions that I don't share. But if I want to pay attention to you closely, I want to understand what is it like to think the way you do? What are the advantages of it? How does it make sense? How does it make sense for you? What are the values that then seem important? And so this work of paying attention then raises the question for me, can I integrate that sense of importance, that th those values that are useful for you, your insights that I might not have noticed or might not have seen, can I integrate them into my way of seeing things so that it's changed slightly? And that is no longer um, a combat. It's more that we become resources for each other because we have different habits, different ways of seeing things, different ways of noticing things, and we can learn to notice more and evaluate what's, what's worth paying attention to most from an ongoing practice of this kind, of careful listening to each other. There's a, there's a slightly similar process that the historian engages with. Mm -hmm. I'm a historian who deals primarily with texts, and I look at a text and I could say to this ancient text, what sort of crazy people could believe this? But actually what I have to do is I have to say is, well, what sort of a world is it that can produce a text like this? And this is a process by which I have to try and, I have to try and imagine the world in the way this text emerge, the, in the way this text imagines it. And by doing that, my own world is increased. Is there a somewhat similar, is that a somewhat a similar? Absolutely, yes, that's, that's precisely what I'm, I'm thinking about. If there's a difference, it's the next stage. It's one thing to imagine how could the world have been so different in those days and then interpret it and explain it. But the next stage is how should that increase my own world and how should it diminish it or, or how, what things would, do I want to leave in the past and not resurrect entirely. So obviously historians do that and uh, it's perhaps largely an unconscious process, but I think the philosophical question is how can you make explicit these continuing processes of evaluation and change and transformation? One thing that comes across when you talk about philosophy as a spiritual exercise, is that the Socratic know thyself tends to imagine itself something like 
you know, the famous statue of the thinker by Rodin, mm -hmm. the agonized, lonely individual looking inwards, and it's a very, it's a very isolated introspection. You seem to present uh, the, the, this spiritual exercise as, even though you, as, as one that's in, engaging in dialogue, it is paying attention to the differences between you and another, and thereby understanding yourself. So the, the, the reflection is by its nature dialogical. Absolutely, and it's probably best pursued in dialogue, in conversation, by having philosophical conversations with other people. But the dialogue can't simply be a matter of, we have different views, let's talk about them. It has to be guided in some way. There has to be another element. And this is the bit that's more comparable to know thyself. One has to be attentive to insights that are generated through this communication process, through this dialogue, whether it's through listening to what other people say and trying to um, gain their insights, or by producing new insights through interacting, internalizing, appropriating what they say, fitting it into one's own concerns and seeing it from a diff different angle. In a way, thinking has to be always guided by different insights and trying to generate them as well. And so I see, would see it as this double process. On one hand, you're listening very hard to someone else, but you're also listening to something within this inner voice that's a productive voice, generating thoughts, generating insights, trying them out, looking at, at reality through their eyes. In a way, actually, it's somewhat similar to the task we engage in in these videos. Absolutely. Philip, thank you very much.